We convene a next generation panel at uh, each of the sessions we conduct around the world, and I think it's always fascinating to have the regional influence as to how this next generation is thinking. How are they thinking about running a business, whether they're maintaining the business that they're working in that start, was started by their families, if they're separating from it and trying to create their own business identity, and particularly in this generation, uh, what is the confluence of social responsibility and business success which informs the decisions? Uh, we have a very esteemed panelist of this next generation of leaders, keenly focused on both the business as well as the opportunity to create impact uh, around the societies in which they operate. So you have their bios. I don't want to waste any of our time uh, going over that, but I do want to start. Uh, why don't we start with Ren? So I think that you have an interesting uh, career trajectory of late. You were with Banyan Tree, which was your family's business, now uh, with Taiwa. Tell us a little bit about the differences of having worked inside a family business, whether or not, and we'd spoken about this last year some, mm. is this notion of creating a different relationship between parents that are in the workplace, and how does, how does a child inside a family business craft their own independent business identity? Well, I think, first of all, I think, uh, just to give a, share a bit more context, uh, Bayan Tree is 20 years old, and uh, Taiwa is 70 years old. So Taiwa was actually started by my grandfather uh, in Thailand almost 70 years ago, and he's one of the pioneers for exporting and actually developing tapioca starch uh, and noodles. So for the earlier part of my career, I spent about five years uh, in Bayan Tree, uh, helping to, to run the China business. And recently, last year, I moved over on the Taiwa side to actually head up uh, the listed company business, because we merged two businesses into one new listed vehicle. Um, well, first of all, the seminaries, the boss is the same. You know, my, my, my dad, you know, chairs both. And I think in that, you know, there's a very strong sense of stewardship. Um, I think when you look at whether it's a 20-year-old business or a 70-year-old business, fundamentally we want to build this business for the next 10, 20 years. So I think that sense of stewardship, the sense of, you know, doing it for the right reason for the company long term has to be very, very strong. Uh, in this particular case in Taiwan currently right now, I'm both you know, owner operator, right? So as owner CEO. So I think the similarity translating from the buy entry side is, is, you know, training myself to think through a longer horizon. So when I think into the managing the company, um, you know, on a quarterly basis, on a multi year basis, there has to be a very strong 10 year view. Mm -hmm. The difference, I think, between then the buy entry side and the Taiwan side is, is well, Taiwan's listed. Um, so there's a certain sense of, you know, managing external shareholders, you know, building the institutional base, but also a sense, a greater sense of autonomy. Um, I think the relationship my dad has been very um, powerful and very inspiring that to this day I still feel very motivated to work for the family business. So under the umbrella of the family business, I think it's you know, the idea of stewardship, but I think under the idea of autonomy is you know, what do you want to create uh, in the next 10 years. In Taiwan, I think there are two or three things we want to create in the next 10 years. So first of all is you know, passionately looking at the future of food. Um, so we started by being pioneers in Thailand and Vietnam. Uh, developing tapioca starch, exporting tapioca starch, and today we export to more than you know, 10 countries around the world, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, China, Japan. So the future of food is something which is very core and very passionate to Taiwan. And that's something how we actually see the next 10 years. The second thing is the future of technology. And I think for any business now, even for a traditional manufacturing business like Taiwan, where we actually have factories, you know, we, we, we take raw materials from the farmers, we go to the factories, we go to distribution. I think the future of technology to traditional businesses the next 10 years is, is a very, very, you know, important theme. So I think these two themes, when I think about, you know, crafting the journey of Taiwan the next 10 years, the future of food and the future of technology, it kind of keeps me motivated and keeps me inspired to actually think through taking the company to the next level. And what, uh, what are the lessons of leadership that you learned from your dad that resonate today? And what do you think you do differently as a leader than he might have? Wow. The one thing I think that um, I've seen him, I mean, I think when you, when you grow up, you have a father, I think you, you see, you know, you obviously see the personal side, right? So besides, you know, what you see in, in, in the external side, like, you know, board meetings, press, you actually see the personal side of, of how he actually talks about business, talks about the struggles. Um, and I think for any entrepreneur, um, you know, this morning I had a great time, I spent an hour with Anthony talking. I think for any entrepreneur for our generation, the next generation, the most timeless value I think is resilience. You know, I think, you know, we are going through the next 10 years of, you know, probably one of the most chaotic times in business. 
I think our generation will not have it easy, so to speak, compared to our parents' generation, right? I mean, the last 20 years, we're riding through economic growth. We're riding on the waves of globalization. We're riding on the waves of just kind of industrialization in Asia. I think the next 10 years, our generation of entrepreneurs will not have it that easy, so to speak. So I think that core value of resilience is very, very important. So being able to be you know, emotionally as possible unaffected by the business and then building it day by day. Second thing I think is just passion to the front line. So my dad, you know, even to today when he goes around to our different hotels, um, when he travels you know, to China, to, to Mexico, to, to all over the world, he really goes to the front line. Right? So he spends a lot of time you know, on the front line you know, talking to you know, the person, whether it's the front office or it's the project engineer. And I think in any business, you know, whether you're running you know, a great startup, whether you're running a, a, a real estate group, or whether you're running a manufacturing business, I think the timeless value of just passion to the front line to actually talk to the people who deliver sales, I think that's timeless. So yes, I think you know, generations change. I think the global macro context change, but I think as entrepreneurs, there are certain timeless values that I think we have to hold core to us. And um, you know, hopefully for succeeding generations, that will always be precious. Mm -hmm. All right, let's, let's uh, go down to Anthony, since you brought him up. Uh, Anthony, you up. have made a you brought me, different You brought me breakfast this morning, so. <laughs> Thanks for, you, you made a different for decision. calling me out to uh, opt to, to start your own business and, and step away from the family business. Uh, tell us about what that experience was like for you, your decision tree in deciding to do that, and what you learned about yourself in the process. Well, it was very humbling. Um, so you know, today, the first thing I noticed when I came in was looking at Fiji water. I was like, wow. You know, I, I remember having Fiji water in my family office. Um, but when I come to our office, we have tap water. Um, and I was just kidding with Renoir. I was looking around. Everybody had nice shoes. And I was like, I, I asked my wife this morning. I was, like, um, I was like, baby, where's my formal shoes? She's like, you don't have any. I'm like, oh, shit. Um, so um, that's, that's a big difference, I think, that has changed. Uh, I wear sneakers all the time now um, because I'm running all the time. Um, how I look at uh, the key differences between my how my dad and myself. Um, so my grand, ju just a quick background, my great-grandfather was a taxi driver. Then my grandfather was one of the first few guys who started the Japanese auto industry in this region, Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam, Myanmar, many, many countries. Um, and, then, and then myself, um, when my father now runs a company uh, across four public listed companies. And he obviously wanted me uh, home, and I was with him for a short while. And I had a privilege of working on, directly under him. But I saw a few great things and not so great things. Um, one of the great things was what he was trying to solve, um, which was safe mobility, affordable mobility right, across the region. It was a very fair thing to solve. Um, and I could respect that ideal a lot. And I could see the problems and the nuances he had to face with government, with local consumers, with local taste. Um, you know, within Malaysia, for example, you have Indians, you have Malays, and you have Chinese. How you sell to each of them are very different. Um, uh, across all the markets, uh, you know, the Philippines is very different from Malaysia. Malaysia is very, very different from Singapore, even though they're just neighbors. Appreciating those nuances. Um, and then appreciating the problem. So there, there are a few big problems. One big problem is, um, you know, in Indonesia, they call it machit, which is the, the traffic problem. Bangkok, you see this everywhere. Manila, traffic is a major problem. Um, safety is a major problem. And even, I would say, to some extent, paying for, you know, it's a very strong cash economy. So 95%, 95 to 90% of Southeast Asia still pays everything in cash. So. We saw all these problems. We saw what my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather was trying to solve, which was safe, affordable mobility. And then we said, how can we solve it from a completely different end, technologically? Completely technology driving it. Um, you know, we have, when we think about you know, who are our best paid people, are all our engineers or data scientists or deep learning scientists, right? That's powering the business and solving it from a completely different lens. So we said, hey, Dad, you probably know how the 40s, the 50s, the 60s think about owning cars. In my generation, 
between 16 years old to 30 in Southeast Asia, a lot of people don't want to own cars anymore. Urban population, if you look at it, if you look at the stats, something like today there's 200 million uh, middle class, and there's going to be 400 million over the next four years. Um, if you look at smartphone growth, Google and Tomasic just came out with a report recently. Southeast Asia is the fastest smartphone growth population in the world. So for us, this opportunity to jump on it technologically and still solving the same problem um, and appreciating how to solve that problem technologically was something that I don't think, till today, my father still can't, you know, I remember when I first pitched the idea to him, he was like, in, in Chinese, he was like, what? Solution in the cloud? Cloud? What are you talking about cloud? Like, like what is this cloud thing, right? Um, and, and I could see that the divide of technological divide and how, you know, and Renoir and I just had this conversation this morning. It's not about innovating to innovate. It's not about, oh, I'm breaking away from my father's business because we don't share the same ideals. He's not the boss. The boss is the consumer. The boss is the next 16-year-old, 17-year-old, 18-year-olds who are using Snapchat. The boss is, you know, 20-year-olds who are going to work and coming back from work every day. The boss and the drivers who are also our boss, they are consuming media differently. They are consuming how to, how to pick up people differently, how to use transportation daily differently. That's what we're innovating for, not for the sake of innovating, not I'm breaking away from my father because I want to prove to him something. It's we are listening to the boss and innovating for that boss. And, and I think that's a good point because this, this notion of fluency in technology and the way this millennial generation is using uh, technology in, in every aspect of their lives is upending our norms. And I think if you look at the demographics around the world, here in Asia, in China and Japan, you have a rapidly aging population that might not be as literate. And then in other parts of the world, like Africa, you have the youngest population in the world. So where, where computers and, and technology is affording people a life they couldn't have dreamed about a generation or two ago. So I want to talk a little bit about that innovation. And let's go to you, Dilhan, because I think in a business like T, which your family is in, how, how are you thinking about engaging these next generations, the millennial generation, and then what is your opportunity to uh, empower them via the philanthropic work that you're doing in the conflict region um, to get involved in a different way? You know, this uh, new generation, the millennials, I know it, uh, it's very fashionable for us to all talk solely about them, but I think equally as the last session uh, um, of this summit uh, shared, uh, it is also important to look uh, at, the, at the, other, the other side, the 60 plus. So taking millennials first to answer your question, tea is known as a comparatively a boring beverage. So reinventing it for the millennials was something that was probably the most daunting challenge in our history. But reinventing a product like tea is possible because it's simply about creating the experience. And when you look at something like tea, it has the provenance, it has the social aspects, it has the possibility of of delivering wellness and so we were very fortunate in that amongst the top five um, motivators or, or causal factors in a purchasing decision we had uh, at least three of them and so re um, sort of reimagining T for a new generation was comparatively easy but it took time because initially our efforts at mixology at, at gastronomy at tea, tea inspired music uh, re really redefining the occasion if you consider the, the occasion considered most um, the, the world's high tea uh, or, or the, the world's tea ceremony, it is the afternoon tea or high tea. And it is based on uh, cucumber sandwiches, scones, something that is an 18th century tradition. So of course in there was the ingredients for disruption in tea talk. And that's where we started, looking at how tea relates with food and beverage. And uh, we were very fortunate because in any country in the world, you turn on the television and you're going to find that at least the three amongst the top five uh, most viewed programs would be food related. So it was, um, it was in, a, in a sense, uh, comparatively easy. But what uh, there, the family aspect, how it changed the way we, we adopted and, and uh, adapted to this new reality and this new customer was the fact that my father would always emphasize the fact that there are certain fundamentals in tea that cannot change, and that relates to tradition. So for example, the tradition of hand picking, 
many would argue that it is uh, an antiquated uh, style and it is uh, irrelevant in this day and age. But unfortunately, or fortunately for us, everything quality in tea begins and it ends with the quality of the leaf because that is where nature does uh, her work. And so um, we remain committed to tradition in a very large, to a very large extent. And strangely, whilst uh, we talk about the millennials disrupting every aspect of, uh, of, of different categories, in this respect, they have actually relished provenance. They have relished tra tradition because they love that aspect of the passion of the tea maker. They love the story of my father's 68 years of his life devoted to tea. So in a sense, uh, we have combined tradition. We have brought it into this 21st century and created uh, not only afternoon tea for the 21st century, but also try to look at how we change the relationship that our millennial guest has with, uh, with tea. And of course, with the 60 plus, uh, it has not been, uh, not been too difficult because there, there is an existing relationship. But on the second part of your question, in relation to the ethical aspects of our business, I think one of the things that we learned earlier on is that whenever you, if ever you align your social um, strategy or plans, whatever, uh, to a consumer or to a marketing objective, you are pretty much sure to fail. And so what we decided was we completely disconnected the Dilma brand with uh, what we conceived to be the, the obligation that we had to, to community and to the environment. And so my father established something completely different called the uh, MJF Foundation, which has uh, very different uh, graphics and, and there is technic theoretically no, no link, except for the fact that Dilma funds at least with uh, a minimum uh, commitment of 10% of its, its pre-tax earnings into the foundation. But what the foundation does, you see, we have, uh, we have a unique situation because Dilma is a brand that was essentially birthed at a time when our country was in conflict. And so um, what formed the brand and therefore what formed uh, the philosophy of the brand uh, was quite unique. Firstly, my father being from a very ordinary, humble home, he uh, um, didn't have much. Uh, and um, the, the philosophy that my grandmother taught him his, has still pervades the business to this day. But also we were, we were uh, birthed in a situation where the country was at war. And so we understood that business has a strong role in peace building. And it's not only the finances. I think um, finance is, is possibly or funding different humanitarian activities. It's, it's the easiest of it all. But business has something more important. Because when you consider poverty alleviation or whether you consider um, marginalized communities as a problem, business is much, much better able at solving that problem and finding solutions than either government, or I must say also, um, in our experience, the NGO sector. Because we looked at it and we said, look, we've got to have a certain engagement, we've got to deliver success, the success is in terms of changing lives, and we've got to move out at a certain point. So it was a, a principle of offering a crutch, and at a certain point taking it away, and if that person falls, then you're in trouble, you've failed. So it was. Uh, uh, what we would uh, consider uh, uh, traditional performance mm -hmm. metrics in, in business. And so we engaged with the war widows, we looked at, we considered, the fundamental difference probably would be the fact that we considered uh, these ladies to be assets rather than the traditional mindset which is to consider them as liabilities. And so we partnered with them, we set up 1,500 businesses and they are chefs, they are, um, you know, what you do is you, you find a, a lady, she might have had a horrific time, but you say, look, yes, uh, hard times happen, but let's uh, look to the future. Uh, what do you do? You cook? Great. Well, here's HACCP training, here's ISO training, here's uh, packing uh, technology, here's a sort of a clean environment. Let's go. Let's get your neighbors together. Let's start a business. You need five people. We don't give you a cent in cash, but we do give you equipment, training, and mentoring. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's been an amazing program because through that, we've managed to solve issues not only relating to um, people victimized or, or uh, suffering from war, but also relating to uh, uh, gender inequality, uh, spousal abuse, so many different mm -hmm. issues by empowering women and, and supporting women. Women are the key to much of it. I know, Leila, you've done a lot of work on, on women's empowerment issues, but I think one of the things that I started with was this notion that this new generation wants to wed what they perceive as a responsibility to cure some of the social ills on the planet with success in business. Your family has been doing this for quite some time. So why don't you tell us about um, your grandfather and how that principle has been instilled in your family through the generations. Sure, my grandfather also started with tea business as uh, perhaps he was just cleaning a 
tea merchant's shop when he was 12 years old, and that's how he wanted to support his family. He, he was a true entrepreneur. He was a prominent businessman um, for, for the country and until today. Um, so we do drink five to ten cups of good big cups of tea every day. So it's a good tea consumer market. But amongst all the businesses that he built, I think one of the very important um, rules that he established within all the generations is, uh, was philanthropy to give back. As a family, we give back 30% of our profit to charity and social works. And with that, we build schools and hospitals. And um, one of the main, main reasons of creating businesses is to create jobs. So I run the family office, but I have my own investment company, and therefore I have my own 30%, which I know doesn't belong to me. So I started looking into areas where I could um, expand beyond the borders of my own country to provide education, um, healthcare, and um, creating jobs, especially for women, empowering women. So one of the things that uh, we do is uh, with artisans around the world, seven areas in the world where we go and find the artisanal works that are dying because all the middlemen make the money and the, the artisan actually doesn't. So through a company in, in New York, we actually um, invest very heavily in those communities. We bring the religions together. We bring the genders together. We give equal wage to all. And we empower them and we motivate them. Uh, we create healthcare programs, education programs, and we get them to produce directly for this very high-end fashion brand that is um, designed and made in New York and present in many of the um, outlets in the world. Um, another thing we do with, um, with, with, with great two women uh, called Trudy Styler and Sally Rattray, we produce movies that is taken, um, there are real storybooks that are, um, that are usually the leading role is often played by men and now we're having them played by women like astronauts, scientists, magicians, we're trying to look into a story in South Africa with black women who preserve wildlife and they're nowhere to be seen uh, with, uh, with uh, collaborations with, uh, with Ms. Nelson Mandela's wife. Um, we, um, we look into all continents' social challenges, uh, whether it's in Asia or it's in the US or Europe or South America or Africa, and we try to in a very peaceful manner, spread the problem to the different levels of audiences and create solutions. Um, we, um, we are creating a VR company um, to, to have a very strong philanthropy uh, vertical that actually links people's emotions to what is actually happening on the ground. Unfortunately, today is about, I think, $380 billion in the US that um, is the assets of foundations where only 5.3% of that is being allocated to the cause. We want to change that because we believe it's time to interrupt um, uh, the, the, the traditional philanthropy through impact investments, hopefully you know, someday in the future, investments will all be impact investments. There will all be, all those decisions are going to be made having in mind, is this going to actually positively impact something in the world, uh, some challenge in the world, social challenge especially. And another problem that we see is, um, you know, a lot of these foundations and um, institutes uh, don't promote well, the social entrepreneurship. Um, a lot of things get lost in transition. They're not connected. They don't share resources. One of the resources that is the, perhaps the most cost efficient is human resources. And they don't share that. And I really look forward to, to the day that we actually start sharing not only human capital, but, but capital um, through these you know, to, through these, um, what I would say, if it's, uh, you know, social impact initiatives, philanthropies, uh, 
different things. And, um, well, and technology has been very effective towards that. This democratization of information and the speed with which people are aware of things they might not have been before enables people to participate in a way they hadn't <coughs> um, I think let's, let's go to Pinot for a moment. So when thinking about across your family's businesses, you are primarily involved in the real estate aspect of that. How can real estate help to further people's ability to have a better life? When you think about the communities in which you operate, lifting people out of poverty, giving the emerging middle class in this region most of all, um, how are you thinking from a business perspective of engaging that? And then also, what is the social responsibility that you feel real estate and, and the development you're doing can, can help lift society? Thank you, Richard. Um, I'm very lucky in my view that I'm passing through into the second generation of the family business. And it has all been created uh, through my father only in the past five decades. And so I see the rise, the difficulty, uh, and also being part of as social responsible in driving the business and growing the business of what we have today as, as the group. As I see it's, it's in always in the belief of, of my father as well, but uh, creating uh, part of the business is to understand and think a bit like Anthony mentioned on, on the view of how you break through and looking at creating a new market and creating something that is better quality of life, that is improve the sense of community and and that lies to how all the business within our group is expanding. And it's, as my role with, within real estate, it is part of very much the nature of our motherland, which is Thailand. We have seen a lot of what we could do. And as we grow the business into Singapore, Australia, and the rest of the world, uh, we have seen how, as real estate is very localized, it is the basic thinking of not the product, but shaping the consumer, shaping the quality of life that would bring all of us into power, into where we see uh, the sense of equality, where we see the sense of uh, sharing. And that is a part of fabric that we, we're seeing. And, and as a business, in terms of the strategy, uh, in the longer term view is, is, is for us to build into human capital, into looking at a new leader, even as we are a young leader today. But it is very much so of how even me, I think I am some, sometimes lag behind the technology, no, uh, not compared to I'm already the tacky, most tacky person in the family. <laughs> but it is, it is that today that technology grow very fast and that mm. we have been created inspiration of, of uh, how we will see the next young CEO Mm -hmm. uh, of the company that rise up and build up in the next two decades and, and how we will see the next leader within the organization to help to grow the business and be adaptive and that will get at the sustainability uh, in terms of understanding the world as much as understanding the ethic of, of our company. In, in view of philanthropy, uh, it is quite a unique thing from, from what my parents has given to us is that they have said they have give all that they can, give us the education, give us the opportunity in the role of professional into the responsible business. But for them, they're thinking for us to inherit the wealth, uh, it's almost as poison. Uh, they're thinking how that value of them giving it back to the society is actually will who give the best uh, inherent value uh, to the family and to us. So it is a strong uh, thinking that thing is embedded in, in the generation. Mm -hmm. And we think it's, it's, it's a fair value. And it's, it's something we, we're very proud of. So it is part of giving is that you have to have to be able to give. Uh, so it is part of the business that we think of the success and sustainability together. And I think very much taking a part of giving as, as, a, as a way to change and shape the market for tomorrow.
Well, and it's an inherent part of your corporate identity to do that. So Renoir, let's, go to, let's stay on this human capital notion for a moment. Are, are you finding as, as a leader seeking talent, or is this next generation wanting to align their value system with the value system of the organization? Is, I mean, is it hard? I can tell you in the United States, we definitely see that. So the people that are coming in their 20s entering the workforce have a very different mindset about not just about the money that their career is going to afford them, but they want that alignment of a value system. So tell us about the talent acquisition and how that informs your decisions. Well, I think when we think through kind of talent in the company today, I think there are different dimensions um, thinking through. I think at the basic level is skills and capability. Um, I think in Southeast Asia today, in, in Taiwan, we have uh, eight operations. So we've got primarily five in Thailand, uh, two in Vietnam, in the next two years, Cambodia and Myanmar. So I think fundamentally, in terms of building talent, uh, skills, capability, managerial skill, I think that's definitely probably a lot better than five years ago. So we actually have you know, a generation of managers who are much more versatile, much more willing to actually take risks, go abroad, start a new factory. So I think managerial talent is, is not really the issue. I think that comes through you know, more education and basically building a skills infrastructure uh, within the organization. But that being said, I think you know, um, looking through building the next generation of, of talent and managers, I think overwhelmingly is, is, is a strong sense of purpose. Um, I think you know, our generation, again, you know, we're, we're not going to see that exponential wealth creation, right? just by definition. Right? If you look at you know, the general economic world today versus 20 years ago, our generation, we're not going to live through 10% year-on-year GDP growth. Right? We're just not. It's just the function of where we are and the function of the economic era of our times. So when we have a generation, you know, broadly speaking, in Southeast Asia and Asia that is not going to live through you know, 10% year-on-year economic growth, there must be more. Right? So there has to be that sense of purpose, that sense of value creation. So in the company today, when we talk about it, when we build it into our business model, you know, whether we're working with farmers, so in certain areas in Thailand, we work with you know, anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 farmers. Uh, in Vietnam, we're working with a few hundred food hawkers. There has to, you know, I think companies, we have to build in that, that sense of purpose. Um, and I think that is, is tough, because the sense of purpose is more than just saying, okay, I'm giving you a 10% you know, increment, I'm giving you a three-month bonus. It's basically saying, in a world today where you know, the next 10 years, we're not going to have exponential economic growth. It's going to be more competitive. How do we create that sense of purpose, you know, into, you know, every layer um, of the organization? So I think it's, it's challenging, but it's important. I think the most important thing, I think going back to the various points, is companies building a sense of purpose, you know, through the next 10 or 20 years. You know, particularly when I think there's going to be a, quite a lot more economic turbulence coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dilhan, let's go to, you're managing the foundation and, and some of the philanthropic initiatives. How do you think about the efficacy of what you're funding and relative to how you think about efficacy inside your business? It's, it's easier sometimes when you have an income statement to determine the success or profitability of something. But when you're funding uh, philanthropic initiatives, how do you think about valuing those? I think as Ren said, it's a question of a sense of purpose. And I think it... Uh, it builds a purpose within our staff, within our employees, but uh, um, on the principle that this millennial generation is so empowered and so connected that there's no way on earth you're going to fool them with anything, you also build an ability to engage with that generation because if you consider today the customer, I mean, we had in the early years of our business until five to six years ago, we had a policy that the left hand should not know what the right is doing and therefore we do. The MJ Foundation operates uh, in, in isolation and in comparative uh, uh, quiet. But that backfired on us because we were then faced with uh, irate consumers saying, look, what the heck are you doing? You haven't got this certification. You haven't got this. You haven't got this uh, uh, ethical uh, compliance, etc. You need to do something. So then we were compelled to go back on an earlier commitment that my father had made that the two should, should stay separate. So I think the short answer is that you cannot establish the link between the business and uh, the, the obligation to the community, but that there is a link in the sense that if you consider that any business, its success is the outcome of the ecosystem uh, that consists of the environment, the community, etc. And if you also consider that inequality is corrosive, it is a precursor to conflict, and it is debilitating in a way that would affect the economy as a whole, then the business has an obligation to uh, deliver strong humanitarian outcomes. And the same applies in the area of the environment. So whilst you cannot measure it, 
I think today it is becoming fundamental. It is a basic standard without which you cannot do business. So I would uh, probably like to suggest it in that way. But equally, I think particularly in our case, in the context of uh, peace building, you, you have you emerge from conflict. You have this similar situation in Colombia happening at, the, at this moment, as we talked of earlier. You have a situation where conflict has created a situation uh, where the country lacks, uh, in particularly in Sri Lanka, care for um, differently abled kids. Uh, you know, what does a, a parent with a child with cerebral palsy do? Do you simply turn around and tell the government, hey, come on, you guys, you've got to get on with it. But the government has uh, so much on their plate with building roads, rebuilding uh, a damaged economy and, and, and uh, infrastructure, that business has to step in. So I think short answer would be that uh, I don't believe that there is a link in terms of performance in between the business and, and uh, uh, the, the giving. But that giving, in a sense, is a foundation that goes much deeper than the business itself. And, and Lili, you've also lived your life against the backdrop of revolution in Iran. Uh, and your empowerment, your efforts to empower uh, women around the world. I mean, how do you how do you view the the success of that? I mean, do you, do you find through Mayed and Maven and all the initiatives that you've undertaken, do you ever get frustrated that it's not happening quickly enough? And what is it that you would change if you could? Um, I think uh, early on, I changed what I thought it's going to scare me, and that's exactly what you said. So. I didn't put a, a hat of a foundation or an institute or an organization on my, on my head. So I was uh, kind of uh, nimble enough to, if there's an earthquake or the situation in Syria, I am involved pre, during, post. And there are initiatives like the artisans that I know it's, I am in the generation that is going to make a lot of mistakes, that is going to have to do those mistakes to get the formula right, so that in the long term, all those impacts are going to be more and more and more measurable, and so that the next generation can, can actually pick it up and make it better. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, for example, what, what I do for the bone marrow um, transplant donation centers that I'm ex we are expanding around the world, you know, when it comes to measuring that, okay, so the more donors, the more samples, the more cure. When it comes to empowering women, you know, the more you educate them, the easier it is to empower them. And it's really, I think, up to the efforts we put. I think one thing, one lesson I learned from history of my grandfather is that he, he, um, he was quite successful before revolution. Revolution came. And within a week, he had to make a decision, either you know, risk his life and his family's life, he might get executed because he was successful, or leave the country like many did. And he actually, my father took the passports to him and said, you know, <laughs> whatever you say. He took the passports, he put them in the garbage can, and he said, we always stay with these people, no matter what, because they need us more. And he built everything again, and uh, he goes on, and it's not an easy country to operate in. But what he hopefully taught all his grandchildren is that it's not about us. It's about the role models we build out of ourselves by whatever we choose to do, however we choose to eat, what we choose to say, the words we choose to use, and the, the decisions we make around our businesses. And um, hopefully that. I will keep on you know, doing that better. But uh, I would say you know, um, everyone is responsible to be conscious and aware of the role models that we're living every day, not in the future, from us to, to the audience. We're touching more and more every day because technology is just connecting us, no matter if we're sitting here or we're sitting some village in another part of the world, we're, we're mm -hmm. definitely getting connected. And, and that technology and connectivity is the basis of your business, Anthony. So what, uh, on the lessons learned front that Lele brought up, what, what do you know now that you wish you knew at the beginning of your, when you started your efforts here? Oh, I didn't realize how much money it was going to cost. <laughs> um, I thought you could just outsource it to some engineers in India and it will settle itself. Um, I was so wrong. I think I didn't, I didn't appreciate uh, talent as much. I, I didn't realize how technology really is 
a game changer. Uh, every time we add a feature, um, and it, it adds you know, 5 to 10% efficiency in a business, uh, bringing our cost structure down, bringing our price competitiveness. So today, we're a price leader across the region uh, through technology. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, being able to operate on a lower cost space and yet attracting global talent, um, that was something I, I, you know, I would never have imagined building an engineering center in Beijing, in Seattle, um, hiring uh, ex-Googlers, ex-Twitter guys, Amazon guys um, who've been in Amazon for 10, 15 years. Um, I think all that I, I, I wasn't prepared for. Um, and I think the only reason why they moved, you know, to, back to the talent question that uh, you posed for Renoir, I think, and, and the philanthropy component, um, a lot of talent these days, at least global talent, what we see, you know, a lot of them, you know, former bankers or consultants, a lot of them have made a lot of money um, over the past 10, 15, 20 years. And what they want, especially among the millennials, um, you talk about guys between 20, you know, guys and gals, between 20 to the late 30s, they want to show to the world, hey, I made an impact. So an engineer, for example, who founded Google Express, uh, who joined us, said, Anthony, you know, in the past it was about move, you know, moving a banner. But with you guys, why did I join you guys? And it wasn't, you know, package-wise, we couldn't beat. Google pays at P90. You can never outpay Google. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a tough battle, right, no matter how much money you have. Um, but they, top global talent wants to know, hey, I can really move the world, right? And he, he said, hey, I'm gonna, if I join you, Anthony, and join Grab, I'm gonna be shaping cities. Um, I'm gonna be building the technology that Southeast Asia has never seen. And, and that's what inspires them, right? And they see, hey, um, Anthony, you know, you've been preaching about this whole that the social model is, a, is an intricate mesh into your business model where social impact and economic impact is no longer mutually exclusive. And hey, every time I help drivers, drivers stay more loyal, your retention cost drops, your acquisition cost drops, better for business, right? When we finance, you know, a lot of our drivers never ever seen the internet before. We gave them their first smartphones, we microfinance the smartphones. Many of them never owned a car before. We, we microfinanced the cars to them. And they became micro-entrepreneurs, right? But having that intricately built created more loyalty, and through more loyalty created better business. I think the interesting thing there is that people don't feel like they're driving, right? They're not assisting others with mobility. You said they feel like they're changing cities, like the engagement factor is so different today than just a job. Right. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, a taxi company would have a hard time preaching that to an engineer at Google, right? I mean, forgive me. Um, but I think for a technology company that is, you know, whether it's a car, a taxi, a bike, um, social P2P car sharing, uh, ride sharing, we have vans, you know, it's basically a, a technology first company. And then you say, hey guys, we want to solve you know, how does you know, your grandmother go to a hospital in the most efficient way? How, does, how, do you, how are you assured that your wife goes to work safely all the time? Right? So we, have, we work with governments, we, we, we filter uh, background checks, you know, we go to extra mile. Right? Because for me and for many of our founding team and all our what we call grabbers, you know, our wives live here, our children live here, our parents live here. You know, you will never hear the end of the day if you mess up and something happens. You will never live with yourself. Right. And this is something, going back to one of the things that you brought up, one of the principles that my father taught me, he said, Anthony, you know, it was not about building a business for yourself or wealth creation. It's about creating and making sure that you are a shepherd leader, right? How do you serve your people such that they are remembered as I'm passing it on to the next group of generation, whether they're family or non-family. 
Well, I think this generation has a, a very different perception about the social contract between right. employees, between customers, Completely as opposed different. to just a business contract. Exactly right. And, and Panod, how, how do you think about that? I mean, if you were to look out 20 years in the real estate business and the, the engagement of cities in creating places that are viable for people to have a life, I mean, how, how do you find that social contract to be unfolding? For me, I, real estate is not directly technology lead. But it's, it's, it has true technology driven uh, in terms of understanding the market. For our strategy, in terms of technology that map into us, uh, to what we are trying to build is the trend of big data, the trend of Internet of Things, uh, sensory. Uh, so all of this will become a big part in real estate development, how technology apply. Um, but it's again end to, to how you pace the community and the society through the product that you build, to the product that you offer, and how you create them to be social responsibility into a part of ownership. Real estate is a part, sense of owner to part of the whole. That how you be responsible as a user uh, within that. So we do a lot of uh, consider. One good thing in, in my view is, is I, I plan for long term and, and that family give me that horizons in planning those things. So that's the advantage of family business. Uh, and within the challenge is, is how, you, how nobody know what's the next trend of retail is. Uh, so that's where the technology leads uh, coming in. But uh, at the end, we still have the view of real estate is a sense of place, it's a sense of, of physical. That, that if you adapt it well, understand it well, you will be sustainable, you will, you will be competitive. Mm -hmm. So that, that's my view. Okay. And, and Dilhan, your merging of the two, both the business initiatives and the philanthropic initiatives, I think when, tell us about what do you think from a stewardship perspective of what you inherited from your father, and I don't mean money here, I mean kind of the principles that you inherited. What, works today, and, and what do you think needs recalibration for this next generation? I think when you look at uh, business future, the one thing that uh, is clear that it is the values of the business that will uh, take that business forward. And today you see uh, giants falling at the hands of comparatively smaller businesses, but I believe that it is those values that uh, endear those smaller businesses to consumers. We have people engaging with us across uh, you know, technology is important. These guys, in many cases, were born with uh, various devices in their hands, and so they're very comfortable with them. So having that medium and using, um, you know, using the medium of the internet to, to comment, to, to talk on global issues, to talk on um, business principles, and, and to actually explain uh, different aspects of what we do has actually cemented uh, a relationship with uh, the customer in a way that was never possible in the past. So there is tremendous opportunity, but that opportunity must be grounded in, in very definite values. So it's the sense of purpose that Ren talked of. And once that happens, I think that uh, what I take from my father is, is the base for that. So in terms of there are certain things, you know, whilst the millennials have disrupted many categories, there are a few fundamentals, and the most important of those is quality that uh, hasn't changed. So if you uh, consider their interest in paying more for certain products that have that assurance of quality and, of course, supported by an assurance of ethics and environmental sustainability, uh, it is unprecedented. Now, we didn't have the same trend uh, in FMCG, say, uh, 10 years ago. It was very, very different. Okay, I mean, uh, you had to do good. That was wonderful. It was wonderful for the cameras, but... Uh, on the supermarket shelf at the coal face, uh, it was price, what's your promotion, are you on EDLP, all this kind of stuff mattered. But today, uh, you have a much more informed consumer. Of course, there's a whole host of other factors, but going back to the past, uh, looking at what my father has passed on, I would say that I have uh, found enormous strength in, in the fact that he has remained committed in the face of uh, an industry going in the opposite direction to artisanal manufacture, to ethics, to integrating ethics into the business. And that aspect of quality, I think, is what is going to make the difference for us going forward. Because at the end of the day, we are a tiny business in, in, in the global scale when you consider us in context of our competition. But uh, 
a few weeks ago I was watching in New Zealand how the chocolate category is such a, 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 a sort of a competitive category and you've got Whitakers, which uh, this uh, beautiful New Zealand family business of father and uh, uh, sons and daughter are, are making tremendous strides and in, in fact have taken over the category or have, have assumed leadership. So that kind of stuff I think is what's going to take us forward but it is genuine and sincere commitment to, to the values that uh, in our case that, that my father taught us. And mm -hmm. in, Renoir, inside your company, what are the most important traits I would need to know to be successful in your company? What's the, what's the part of the culture I would need to know best in order to be successful with you as the leader? Within, within, within Taiwan? Well, first of all, I think as a company, we, when we look at the vision, we actually have the, um, we call it Taiwan 2020. So within, you know, by uh, five years, uh, we actually want to expand the wings of regionalization and innovation. So within five years, we will actually be present all throughout ASEAN. Um, within five years, we will actually innovate a lot more in terms of new products. So the pillars for the company in terms of strategy would be around regionalization and innovation. But I think it comes back again to the point of uh, shared purpose. And it comes back to the point of what are the guiding values. So the guiding values in, in Taiwan, when we reformed the company last year, were you know, pride, integrity, and consistency. And I think any company over time has to be a values-driven company. I think strategy is important. I think strategy you know, sets the guidelines for execution of, of business and business plans. But when you hire someone, and you groom someone, and you promote someone, you are fundamentally you know, grooming them based on values more than skills. And I find that increasingly so. I find that now when we you know, actually look at across the different verticals, so the last one year, I built a team, a, a younger generation Thai team across all the different verticals, finance, marketing, sales, supply chain, and all that. Skills-wise, I think everyone is, is competent. So I think we've reached a stage where I think a lot of you know, companies that are building regional businesses and global businesses, I think skills and competency is more or less at a certain equilibrium. So you know, you're very good at finance, very good at marketing, supply chain, let's say. But what gives you that extra spark I think as you know, within the company and, and to be actually successful within the company is really around the, 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 the values driven. Mm -hmm. The I second point- You can point, teach people skills, but character is inherent. Well, in character, I think character is inherent. I think character is, is symbiotic, right? I think character is, is guided by you know, the, the, the vision of the company is really guided by the leadership tone. Mm -hmm. So yes, you know, we have to be profitable, but yes, we have to do things a certain way, but you know, what are the guiding core values? Right? If we say we pride consistency, what are we doing in the manufacturing plant? If we say that we actually really abide by integrity, how do we treat suppliers? How do we treat quotes? How do we treat working capital? If we say we really abide by pride, you know, how do we bring the best of Thailand to the rest of Southeast Asia? But just a quick side point to that is I think one of my most, what keeps me awake and, and kind of like impassioned at night is I think the future of organizations in the next 20 years will not be just the vertical disciplines. Right, so traditional 20th century companies are built through you know, the classic management principles of finance, marketing, operations. And you build talent that way. But the 21st century organization has to be probably built around different horizontal disciplines because things are changing so fast around talent, around data, around technology. You know, to be a CEO in the 21st century, right, you have to probably understand talent and data much, much deeper than understanding finance, marketing, supply chain. Mm -hmm. right, you, can, you can always learn about finance, marketing, supply chain. But if you're gonna build a company for 20 years, if you're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna take this to a different level, a very, very deep understanding of how do you think about talent capability, how do you think about data capability, and how do you think about technology? Those are actually horizontal disciplines that I think in 21st century organizations is very different from the classical kind of vertical functions that most companies has, and it's gonna be pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. And, and lately, let's go to you. What, how do you define success in what you're doing in your various initiatives? Because you, you have many. And, and I think, so how, how do you determine what's working and what's not? Good question. Well, um, if I compare them with my expectations, they're, they're, <laughs> they, they have a long way to go to be successful. <laughs> but um, I think, um, how I measure success in all these businesses. Clearly we don't prep the questions in advance, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think success is uh, very relevant to, um, to your values. 
Um, and um, based upon the values that I set for, for myself and, and for the businesses that I start and choose to run, are if, if those values are maintained and sustained. Mm -hmm. And it's less about money, but more about sustainability and, and people that it's impacting, mm -hmm. whether directly or indirectly, and if they're having social impact. Okay. Yeah. All right, we have a, a few moments left, uh, so why don't we open it up to you questions? We've got a wonderful panel up here. I want to take that opportunity. Yes, sir. Folks, thank you all for your great... Could you wait for a moment? We're going to have a microphone. Thank you all for your great insights and comments. Uh, across your answers, one of the questions that comes to my mind is you yourselves, having had the benefit of all the learning and the exposure and the guidance and the vision about where you want to take the business, struggle to guide your teams into your futures. But how do you, how do you take that culture and that vision down deeper into the DNA of the organization? How do you make sure that they can grow and transform with you, you know, two, three levels down and, and carry the same inspiration? Um, because that can sometimes be more challenging. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. oh. So uh, one way I, I hold, um, I have a number of direct reports. I hold uh, one-on-ones uh, every two weeks. Um, that's really important. Um, again, I serve them. I always say, hey, my job here um, is to serve you and remove all the bottlenecks from, so really playing out servant leadership in a strong way, right? All the way from my direct reports. And then um, beyond the one-on-ones, what I consistently do is, so yesterday, lunch, night before uh, dinner, lunch, um, meal times, I try to just get a bunch of, say, our UX guys, our uh, user design, our uh, engineers, our data scientists, um, in a group of, say, pizza-style six, seven guys. And I go, hey, what is one thing that you really like about Grab that we should double down on? What is one thing? So I, we just go all the way down um, all the time. So myself cut all the BS, right, in the middle layer and go down to the engineers, go down to, I, I do this with all the country teams across 30-plus cities. Um, I, and then just going down, and, and the beauty about um, being a, such a consumer-centric product is that you know, I can literally, you know, coming here, I took a grab, uh, talked to the driver, hey, uncle, uh, give me some feedback, and then bah, 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 everything will come out, you know, my auntie business, you know, everything. And then just like taking down notes, right, and then iterating, and then immediately, you know, I had the pleasure of one, one, one of our guest speakers, um, uh, Clemens, who, who, who took a grab ride, gave me feedback straight away. I, I can straight away iterate and, and give feedback directly, serving, you know, showing, it's not just talk, right? Our principle of out serving a customer, servant leadership, by playing it out with your direct reports and all the way through. I think, in, mm. yes. adding to that, I, I like that question very much that it is what we do, almost vision and mission we need to have to communicate to our investor, but it's overrated to. To, to be able to bring it down. Uh, so the word that we did use is how do we create our DNA and bringing that input uh, from the staff and bringing down the ethics uh, to the staff is what we created it in terms of internal communication. Uh, and I try to bring that value from the family uh, down as well as uh, in somewhat what's, what was not often mentioned uh, within the company or uh, large conglomerate is the word like respect to other, being humble, uh, and also within, within the vision of what the company is looking for is, is you are not looking at yourself as a, as a competitive in the industry. You're looking at yourself as a part of the industry, uh, how you build up collaborative, how you, so there's a word that we paste down uh, in crafting up the DNA that we want. So, and that's more important within the organization and how you're going to drive the next leadership, how you're going to tell them what they need to shape themselves up into the organization, into the value chain. All right, well, we have unfortunately uh, come to the end of our session, but I want to thank each of the panelists. Uh, you can feel great that these are the future leaders of, of this region. Thank you. Thank you.